Hi everybody. So today we're going to be talking about biotechnology. So let's go ahead and break down this word. So first I see this prefix bio and I hope that at this point in the year everybody knows what that means. Bio means life because remember this is biology, the study of life. And then I see this word technology. So if I put these two things together, what we're talking about today is technology that deals with life. And more specifically, technology that kind of messes around or plays with life in some way. So let's talk about how we do this. Now, biotechnology is based on the idea that all organisms have something in common with one another. So if I look at all of these different living things here, like a tree and a shark and a bacteria and a horse and a cactus, all of these things have one thing in common. They all have DNA. And because of that, I'm going to be able to mess with this DNA and mix and match between these different organisms. Now, it's, it's worth stopping for a second thinking about if we all have DNA, me and a horse and a tree and a bacteria, then how come I'm not a horse or a tree or bacteria? What makes us different? Um, and in order to answer that question, we got to zoom into our DNA. Remember, you should be writing down these things that are underlined on your paper while I'm talking. So if I look inside of my DNA, I see my nitrogen bases, which are the four letters in DNA, T, a, C, and G. And we've talked a lot about these nitrogen bases and how they like to pair up with one another. Now, the order of these nitrogen bases is the instructions for how to build you or how to build a tree or a bacteria. So even though we all have DNA, the order of the letters of the nitrogen bases inside of us is different. So because we all have DNA, but it's just slightly different in each type of organism, we can actually mix and match our DNA. Again, make sure you're writing down these things that are underlined on your paper. When we mix and match DNA, when we mix and match genes from different organisms, we call that genetic engineering because we are engineering genes. So let's talk about how we do this. So in order to engineer, to mess with genes, I have to have a way to cut DNA. What I need are some DNA scissors. In biotechnology, there's a specific type of molecule that can act as DNA scissors. These molecules are called restriction enzymes, and their job is to cut DNA from different organisms so that we can possibly combine DNA from different living things. Um, remember this word enzymes, we've seen that before. Enzymes are molecules that speed up, that catalyze chemical reactions. So in this case, a restriction enzyme is a molecule that speeds up a reaction that cuts DNA. So let's take a look at how this works. So this is what's called a plasmid DNA, which is just a circular piece of DNA from a bacteria. I'm going to cut my plasmid using a restriction enzyme, and I'm going to paste some DNA in there from another organism. Now that all sounds great, but let's zoom in and see how this works on a molecular level when we look closely at our DNA. So if I zoom in, I see my double helix, my DNA, with the nitrogen bases, the letters inside of the DNA. Now let's say I want to cut this DNA and stick in some new letters, some new genes from a different organism. First I get my DNA scissors, my restriction enzymes, that are going to come in and cut the DNA. Now what's cool about restriction enzymes is they leave these little sticky ends, which are kind of like tape or glue that we can come and stick something onto. So here's my gene or my DNA that I want to stick inside of here, my DNA of interest from another organism. Now in order to get it to really stick, I'm going to need some glue to hold it in. That glue is a molecule we've talked about before called DNA ligase. So it's going to come in and glue my two pieces of DNA together. Now this is pretty cool. I've just attached DNA from two different organisms and made one big DNA molecule. So we're going to talk a little bit about we, what we call this new DNA 
and what we call the organism that we might put this DNA into. So let's go into some of the vocab. So this new DNA that has DNA from two different living things, so this came from one living thing and this came from a different living thing, is called recombinant DNA. Now if I look inside of this word recombinant, and again make sure you're writing this down on your paper, I see this um, root, which looks a little bit like the word combine. And that makes sense because recombinant DNA is combining DNA from two organisms. Now let's talk about what we can do with that DNA. So we can take that recombined, that recombinant DNA, and we can put it inside of another organism. This new organism will be called a transgenic organism. Again, make sure you're writing this down on your paper. Transgenic meaning it has genes from multiple places inside of it. So here in this picture I'm going to take this recombinant DNA and I'm going to put it inside of this organism. What I'll have in the end once I've created that is something called a transgenic organism. Now, let's talk about one example of this, a very famous one in biology. So, this is a jellyfish, and jellyfish have a gene inside of them that has nitrogen bases, letters inside of it, that code for a protein that make the jellyfish glow. Um, so, if you've ever seen a jellyfish in the ocean at night, you might have noticed that it glows. Now we can take this gene out of the jellyfish and put it into other organisms like tobacco plant. Look at that tobacco plant glow. Or we could put it inside of a frog and make the frog glow. Or we could put it inside of a all right, picking up where Ms. Hines left off, we can also take that same piece of DNA from a jellyfish and put it inside of something like a mouse. So here you see I have uh, six mice. Three of these mice actually have the jellyfish gene, so they're actually transgenic organisms and they're glowing just like jellyfish do. The other three mice that you see here in the middle do not have the gene, so they are not transgenic, they do not have the recombinant DNA. All right, here's your stop and jot. Take a moment, pause the video, and see if you can answer questions one through four on your own by referring back to your notes. Now the next thing that we need to ask ourselves is how can we compare DNA? Well, when we compare DNA, basically we're just looking at the letters. So here are two DNA molecules. I have one molecule over here, and then I have another molecule over here. I'm going to go ahead and label them 1 and 2 so you understand what I'm talking about when I'm comparing them. When I'm comparing DNA, I want to make sure that I'm actually looking at the letters. So here I have a T, T, C, A, G, T. And if I look at this DNA molecule, I have a T, G, C, A. So clearly these are two different molecules because they have a different sequence of letters. And that different sequence can mean the difference between having a human being or having a banana plant. So how can we compare DNA? We can compare DNA by using a special technique called DNA gel electrophoresis. Let's break this up because it's a really long term. So let's start with the first part. We call it gel electrophoresis because we actually use a gel that's very similar to something that you guys have probably eaten before, something called Jello, which is made up of something called gelatin. It has the same consistency. Then if we look at this next part, electrophoresis, I'm going to break this word in half and look at the first part first. So let's look at electro. The electro stands for electricity. The reason why we use electricity is because electricity actually gets our pieces of DNA to dance or to move and that's the whole goal. We want them to separate out. Phoresis basically means pores or holes. So we're going to use a gel that has holes and when we apply electricity to it DNA can dance or move through those holes. So we want our DNA to be separated out by size just like we see here in this video. So let's pretend that that little tube contains all kinds of DNA. We want that DNA to be separated out by size. So we want to have our shorter strands, our medium strands, and our longer strands all separated out. So we're going to use this technique of gel electrophoresis to do that. So how are we actually going to place the samples into the gel? 
Well, we're going to use very sophisticated tools. So we have this thing right here called a pipette, which is just like a fancy eyedropper. It's just very specific. We have our sample of DNA, and we're going to have to put it into our gel in order to run gel electrophoresis. So we're going to need a sample of DNA. That's what you need to write down in your notes. And we're going to place it at the holes at one end of the gel. So here's what it looks like. So here comes my gel, which is very similar to Jell-O. I have holes or openings at the top. That's where I'm going to place my DNA samples. And if you look at that magnifying glass, you'll notice that my DNA is actually porous. It has holes. So here comes my samples that I've just put into the holes or the openings at one end of my gel. So let's see what's going to happen after that. So remember I told you in order to get DNA to move or to dance, we need to incorporate electricity. This is really important. That's where the electro comes from in the name DNA electrophoresis. Something else to keep in mind while you're um, writing down your notes is that D or the bigger the DNA is, the slower it moves. So let's take a look and see why that's the case. So here again is my gel. I've already placed my DNA sample. Here comes my electricity that I'm going to use to get my DNA to dance. Remember this gel isn't solid. It actually has little holes in it. So as we're allowing the DNA to move because of the electricity, we're going to look and see that DNA has to move through all of these openings. It's kind of like a maze. And something to keep in mind is it's hard for these bigger pieces of DNA to move through that maze quickly. So our smaller pieces of DNA are going to be down here because they can get through the maze really quickly because they're short, but our larger pieces of DNA are going to be up here at the top because they can't move through the maze as quickly. So these are going to be my bigger pieces of DNA, and these are going to be my smaller pieces of DNA. Now, let's take a moment and practice reading a gel. When you're reading a gel, remember each one of these bands... So I'm going to write this down. Each band equals DNA. And we can compare the sizes of our bands because we know that DNA moves based on its size. So again, let's go ahead and label this. We know that these guys are going to be our big pieces of DNA. So these are going to be our bigger pieces. And these guys are going to be our smaller pieces. So these are our smaller DNA molecules. Now, you guys, I'm sure, have seen a gel like this before. If you've ever watched something like CSI or any type of crime show or forensic show on television, you'll know that they talk about these and sometimes call them DNA fingerprints. We call them fingerprints because they're as unique as fingerprints are to people. Everybody has their own set of DNA unless you have an identical twin. So in this example, we're going to pretend that we t have taken DNA from a crime scene. So this is the DNA that we've actually collected that we believe belongs to the person who actually committed the crime. Now we have three suspects. We have to figure out which one of these three suspects actually committed this particular crime. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare the banding patterns of each suspect to our crime scene. So let's look at suspect number one. So we're looking for a band here, a band here. We're going to look at the really dark bands as our markers. So if we look here, we already know there's a problem with suspect number one because there are bands missing. Because there are bands missing here, we don't even have to look down here any further. Suspect number one did not commit the crime. Now let's jump over to suspect number three, comparing this set of bands to the crime scene. Again, if we look at the very top, we notice that there are bands missing. Because there are bands missing, we know that that's not a match. We can get rid of suspect number three. That leaves us with suspect number two now. Suspect number two, if we can compare the bands, this one matches, this one matches, this one matches, this one matches. And if we can go all the way down, we note that all of these are direct hits or direct matches to the DNA sample that we found at the crime scene. So what does that tell us? It tells us that suspect number two left genetic material at the crime scene. All right, here's your stop and jot. Take a moment, pause the video, read over the question, and then figure out who committed the crime.